Well, good evening. I'm Bob Graves, and they call me the unconventional pastor, and it's good to be back with you here again on Sunday evening. And uh, I've had a, a, a quite a busy and hectic, uh, difficult and awesome weekend all rolled into one. Uh, you you, you want to hear about it? <laughs> Maybe not, but uh, my wife and I are trying to get some drapes up in both uh, uh, in in two different rooms. And it seems like every combination we've been trying to put together this way, that the color wasn't right. We needed something that had to be hemmed, didn't have the right thread. Then we had brackets that had to be bent in order to get installed. And there's, me, needless to say, none of the drapes are up yet. We still have to go do a few different things. And some of the screws that came with some of the brackets are not liking going into solid oak, even though I've been drilling holes into it. Uh, they, they like to come. Anyway, so it's, that was frustrating. And uh, about three o'clock this afternoon, I said, I've got a show to do, and I'm just going to go think about that. <laughs> and uh, But this weekend also, I had, um, I had a uh, 60th birthday party, sort of. Uh, the class that I graduated with uh, from high school, most of us have been turning 60 this year, and some of us are almost about ready to do that. And some like me, I'm, I'm 61. But... Um, uh, we, uh, we we had this birthday party for us and we, we met and we had like a, a third of the class that was able to come, some flying in from California, some flying in from Florida, uh, from all over the place. And so it was just awesome to be able to uh, spend some time with uh, former classmates and see some of them I haven't even seen since uh, graduation. Uh, but anyway, so that that was an awesome part of the, the weekend. So I guess it all kind of equaled out, and uh, and so I'm in a better mood. <laughs> Anyhow, it was a little frustrating. Now tonight is going to be a little bit different than what I have normally done on a Sunday evening, and part of the reason is that I was hoping that at the class reunion, I just might meet someone there who uh, might be a, a real logical guest to see if I could. Uh, uh, bring them on for uh, this Sunday night. And as it turned out, although I did meet a few people who might be interested in doing that in the, f the future, uh, it isn't going to work out uh, for tonight. And so uh, that means that uh, you're stuck with my miserable self after all those drapes that we had trouble with so that uh, that I'm here and I'm going to be my own guest tonight. Uh, it'll be a little bit different, but uh, I, I promise you I'll, I'll try to be on my best behavior and, and be in a good mood. And not that, but we just had a delightful conversation in the previous show uh, with, with Greg Bray, uh, just just an, an awesome guy. And, and I, I enjoy being uh, a guest on his show and uh, talking about the various different uh, ideas that come up uh, from his point of view and my point of view as we in many ways are, are very similar in various ways very different. So that was, uh, that was uh, just an awesome show. I, I appreciate Greg so very much. But tonight, um, the thing that I was prepared to talk about if I couldn't get that guest, and so that's what we're going to do, is I wanted to talk about uh, some of the, um, the the nature of the way that we come to uh, the beliefs that we settle into. Uh, and uh, one of the things that even Dr. Jones often talk about is I, I think he uses the phrase, you know, fixed or, or rigid beliefs uh, where we, we try to settle someplace from where we never have to move and how that's – that's not a good idea. But um, being a person who himself has gone through uh, you know, some paradigm shifts, some, some changes in thinking uh, that I've begun to see not only healthy, but I've begun to see the process of changing in my thinking as the lifestyle. In fact, I, I've come to understand that it is the real meaning of the word that is traditionally translated as repentance. Um, uh, the concept of repentance is just loaded with meaning that isn't even a part of that word in the New Testament. But uh, the, the word, you know, literally is discussing the idea of coming to a new way of thinking. Think differently. Um, think again, and uh, that uh, in a sense, uh, a repenting lifestyle is a lifestyle where you're continually open to saying, now, wait a minute, uh, there's something I didn't know before. I wonder how embracing this changes a few things and then being open to those changes. You see, I see the the process of the life that we're going through 
in fellowship with an indwelling presence of Christ in our lives. The living love is in uh, was described even um, in the book of Romans as you know being transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that this is a a lifestyle of discovery, of coming to an, a newness of awareness of things. Um, and, and in that process, it, it requires an ongoing, uh, changing set of um, insights and understanding and, and a willingness to free fall, as it were, to wherever this takes us and, and a willingness to be honest with all of reality and to um, – and, and not that it, we're under any task to – and hurry up with it. But you know, as life is, we can face it as it is, deal with it as it is, think about it as we experience it. And even if we can't take in all of it, and we can't um, – Whatever it is you end up doing with it, this will be great. It will be fine. But there's this uh, uh, th this contrary notion that I think really causes us to dig our heels into the ground, stalls the, the, the process that we're in of transformation by settling into certain beliefs and ideas that we're saying, and that's it, and we can never leave these ideas and these beliefs, that these are just the way it has to be, and then to set up a, a set of sanctions whereby we punish or, or excommunicate or do things to other people who somehow um, challenge those, those uh, rigid beliefs. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about a free-for-all where, oh, just think anything in the world you want to. There's plenty of things that I can respect that other people think and believe, and yet I don't think that way, and I don't believe that, and I've considered it, and I don't buy it. But, you know, that may be where that person is at this time, and that's that's fine for them to be there and work things through so long as their process is one of openness to trust that the capacity and the ability that they have will will have a, this this ability through authenticity uh, to discover and to find out, particularly if they can do this in a context where they are respected and loved. This can this can really um, make this process one that is for all people, transforming and self corrective. But I want to talk a little bit more about the, this this concept of you know so. These fixed and rigid beliefs. What are some things we can we can notice about them? And this may be part of the 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 little bit of that anthropologist in me um, that I that I got from studying linguistics. That um, that I want to talk about some of the observations I've made about this dynamic. Um, uh, you know, these uh, these fixed and rigid beliefs can be in contrast to indecision and uncertainty. I, I don't recommend that we live in indecision and uncertainty either. Um, there's a balance. There's a sense in which we are coming to a familiarity with things where um, there, there's an area where we feel um, – rather confident, an area in which we are experimenting, then the horizon is a mystery and what's over the other hill we're yet to discover. So in our lives, there's this, there's this balance that we're seeking to discover between things that, uh, that, uh, that have relatively different degrees of, of certainty and confidence involved with them uh, and, and where we're always willing to take those new things that we uh, validate understand or experience and incorporate them into the way we think. Uh, so there's this balance that we're looking for. And who knows, uh, th that's, it's easier said than done, but at the same time, uh, just do it. And, uh, and, and it seems to find a way of getting done. <laughs> now, we need not resort to extremes of the, uh, you know, uh, that seems the easy way to do it. Uh, the, 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 oh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the, the passive aggressive way of saying, well, I can't know that, so I just give up. I, I can't know anything. Or the other thing, well, I'm absolutely confident of, of this. I believe God has shown me, and da 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 da, you know, so forth and so on. We can avoid these extremes. Uh, knowing or not knowing is, is not really how we come to believe anyway. Belief is a matter of familiarity, and it, it, it is a, an experience of trust that after a while becomes something that we can um, begin to count on. We can gain confidence in it and it works best when it's 
in a context where we uh, sense ourselves not only loved but worthy of love, that when we're free, where uh, the, the risks of being uh, wrong are merely just an opportunity and not a, a condemnation, not a shame, uh, just a part of the process. Think of uh, – We've often heard it said from other people who uh, – some motivational speakers who use this sometimes where Thomas Edison inventing the light bulb. Um, he kept a record of all of his experiments, what he was trying to do, what you know, what, what the purpose of the experiment was and how he was going to determine if the experiment succeeded or failed. And he uh, conducted – I think it was when he finally reached the 1,000 mark, when he had 1,000 experiments of trying to create the light bulb. Now, I have no idea if this is a true story, but this is the story you hear that um, – He'd failed in creating the light bulb yet and he'd had a thousand experiments and someone had uh, supposedly asked him, well, how do you feel having tried to create a light bulb? You've done this a thousand times and every single time you came up a loser. How does that make you feel? You know, uh, is this discouraging? And um, the, supposedly the answer that Thomas Edison gave, Thomas Edison gave was – uh, no, no, uh, I don't feel that way. I, I feel like I've isolated 1,000 ways that it, it that it can't be done. And the, the odd thing is that when the incandescent light bulb was invented, finally successfully, the the various aspects of that bulb, the way it had to be in a – it had to be made of a particular type of metal alloy, I guess. Certain currents, certain types of coils had to be in a vacuum, the glass bulb and all that other stuff that um, – all of those things that were necessary to make it work were insights that were gained from why the other experiments failed. Those actual failures were a part of the information that led to the discovery. And there's a sense in which, you know, this is the way the lifestyle of repentance, as it were, of the paradigm shift works. There's no guarantee that the next conclusion we make is going to be the one that works. But as long as we're in this lifestyle, we're in the process of eliminating the possibilities, of discovering the possibilities, and to the degree that we possess an ability to discover, we will. And to the degree that we don't possess the ability – it doesn't matter and we won't. And <laughs> that's all there is to it in a sense. Now, there's an assumption by some people that um, everyone should have specific, definite, unchangeable beliefs. Uh, they, they expect this of everybody to hold a certain opinion. It seems to be almost a personality style that comes to this. Uh, and the important issues of life especially should have clear on them. Ambiguous uh, solutions. And uh, these people sometimes um, will actually not even trust you if you if you seem to hem and haw or or possess any sort of uncertainty or openness to some of the more important issues. Oh, we got a comment coming in. Let's see what we got here. Um, viewer comment. Doubt and belief uh, is darkness. It isn't a good thing. Repentance isn't being in the dark. It's coming into the light, knowing and believing without doubt. Um, that strikes me as being a, a, a comment that is – you know, certainly more in keeping with the way some of these views have been held traditionally. Um, but um, I don't think that doubt and disbelief is necessarily dark. I think that um, the darkness that we we sometimes think of spiritually is not based necessarily in the doubt, but in a clinging to the doubt and a clinging to the uh, the, the resistance to to the light. Uh, as Jesus uh, even said that you know men loved darkness rather than light, and so because their deeds were evil, they don't want to come to the light. There's actually a motivation here uh, that that has to do with this kind of darkness. This is a darkness that is not just the fact that, well, there doesn't have to be any light on. This is a darkness where one is refusing to come to the light. And of course, you know, the odd thing about it is this, there's, you stop to think about it, there's no such thing as darkness. Uh, it's, it's an absence of light. Darkness in and of itself is nothing. Um, and, and so coming to the, you know, you don't, you don't turn off the darkness, you just, you know, you, you, you come into the light. And, um, but anyway, uh, you know, doubt and disbelief um, is not darkness. Darkness is darkness, and I think that doubt and disbelief is, is simply the the consequences of being in darkness. And we are all, to a degree, uh, uninformed. 
And uh, a lifestyle of faith is one of discovery. Now, I, I would say that it, you, know, you say it isn't a good thing. Um, certainly not a good place to stay. Um, certainly uh, the things that you don't know could become relevant and important and uh, you could um, end up suffering or, or cause suffering as a result of it. And, and that's really not a good thing. But unfortunately, uh, we are who we are. We know what we know. We don't know what we don't know. And the process of getting anywhere different is going to be in various ways a process of discovery. And that's going to have to be OK because that's the only way we can do it. Uh, and um, so uh, there's a sense in which I don't want to you know, uh, somehow make a, a value judgment on the fact that people might be in that process. The other thing is that um, – uh, repentance isn't being in the dark. It's coming into the light. Uh, I would agree with that part of the statement in terms of what the word repentance really means. The changing of the mind. The mind is changed not because it's told to but because the light reveals things and your brain – In a, if I could use the, the, the metaphor here, your brain says – Oh, look at that. There it is. I can see it now. The, now that the light is on, I see that it is there. And now you can no longer move and move forward in denial that it is there and incorporating that into the way you manage things in your life and understand things in your life and the way you're going to be honest with things in your life. That that process is a, a process of repentance and, um, and it, it isn't being in the dark. It's actually coming into the light, um, you know, and – uh, but knowing and believing without doubt, um, I think many times our initial conclusions are premature, uninformed, require a little more experience. And I think that they can become over time far more uh, certain, filled with less doubt. But uh, as is typical of us as human beings, I think that we come to uh, to truth, first of all, when we see it. It's so foreign to us that anything that we learn new is always something we try to understand in light of what we already know. And if what we think we already know is in some ways incorrect, then uh, we need to go through this sort of a paradigm shift, a, a rearrangement of axioms as it were before – before we can settle into something with with a, a more responsible sense of certainty, uh, but I, I I understand the the intent here. I, I think that uh, you know there is a sense in which um, this process of coming to, into the light is definitely a very good thing, very important thing, a very uh, a very useful thing. And so um, and and dilly dallying or taking your time unnecessarily or holding on to the darkness simply because. Um, I kind of like the advantages that are working for me not being more honest. Uh, that's, a, that's a serious problem. It's a, it's a problem that indicates that uh, there's not really a, 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 an excellent viable love at, acting in, in that time because uh, how do you justify such a decision as that? We can understand that fear – Fear of the unknown, fear of what's gonna what it's gonna cost you. The, these are perhaps in some ways understandable, but we have to face them. We have to deal with them. Uh, viewer comment: um, If repentance means to change your mind or think differently, then can't you repent in a way that isn't coming into the light? Well, sure, I guess you know I could I could instead of deciding to believe that the sky is blue, I can start believing it's green. Uh, and that's a change, but um, you know, if what I'm changing my mind about is not based on some sort of uh, some sort of reason or rationale, and and let's recognize this that the light here spoken of is in some ways metaphoric. If it's not, if if you're not changing your mind because of something that you now see to be there. <laughs> Why are you changing your mind? Uh, I suppose at times we can experiment, you know, and say, well, let's try this and let's try that. But I don't see that as repentance. I see that more as searching, you know. Um, so, I mean, now in terms of the, main, the what the word actually means, well, yes, yeah, sure, you know, uh, entertaining new ideas is a good idea, but it's but it's it, it's really more of an exploratory thing. Whereas uh, most of the times when the Bible is talking about repentance, um, the, the word metanuo, um, um, it's not really talking about, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, think differently and then come up with some ideas, although that's, that's part of it. It, it, it implies this notion of 
there are things here that uh, you need to see and you're not seeing them now for well, whatever reason. But the process of your life in living loved and in the presence of God will bring certain things to light. And when they're brought to light and there they are and you see them, well, there they are. And now in light of that, uh, how do we how do we incorporate this from here on out? I see that as the the the, the purpose of repentance. Uh, the purpose of repentance in the Bible is not well change your mind, just you know, maintain some variety the spice of life. Well, that's true and it's good to do that too, but but that's not necessarily what's talking about. Anyhow, as we're as we're looking at this, um, I think of some people who had some rather rigid and fixed beliefs. Uh like the Pharisees who come to Jesus, you know, and they and they they say, you know, can you can can you show us a sign uh that that you, you are, you know, that you have the authority to do these things and and <clears throat> Jesus wouldn't give them a sign. Uh, in, in Mark, he just says he wouldn't give them a sign, and he 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 walks away. I think in other sections of the of the biblical text in Matthew, I think there's even two places, that, if I'm not mistaken, where they look for a sign, and and here uh, it's embellished a little bit more, where where Jesus says it's an evil and wicked generation that seeks for a sign, and the only sign that's going to be given you is the sign of Jonah, which when you stop to think about it, what kind of a sign is is that? Uh, not not necessarily even a clear one. But uh, it seems to be that in this process of things coming to light, the, the kind of information that allows us to shift our thinking, uh, that, that the signs, as it were, are not the sort of things that are given upon demand or request, but rather they are the things that also – it's not like, okay, oh, now we know who you are and now we know that you're, you're from God and that this is the authority that you have. It wasn't as if these Pharisees were going to walk away from Jesus that day satisfied. It didn't happen. In fact, I'm going to get at this in a little moment. Even Jesus' own disciples don't actually know who he really is. They're not certain and Jesus is not on their back to make sure that they are. Um, uh, you know, Jesus was asked a number of uh, times to make a clear position on political issues, doctrinal issues, ethical issues. And more often than not, Jesus would rebuff the, the questions and he actually pursued something that was more uh, uh, more directed towards, well, what motivates the question? Uh, and so um, – I don't know that that the process of repentance is even one where Jesus is trying to come to us and say, this is what you're thinking? Stop it. Let me show you this. Okay, start thinking this way. Don't slip up. I, you know, um, there's a process of familiarity. In, in fact, uh, you know, I, I've, I've noticed that uh, people who want solid and clear answers, they often perceive people who are more open-ended as being you know, wishy-washy or they actually think we're guilty of deception. Uh, some people actually seem to think that everybody has clear and distinct rigid beliefs. They're just, they're just trying to be a little more diplomatic in their protocol and they're only acting open-minded, but they really already have their minds made up. They don't know that true there are some people who who, who do that uh, and uh, but not everyone who's trying to find this balance of of care and honesty in approaching things is, is, is a person who's deceptive or necessarily even wishy-washy um, there's a tendency in rigid thinkers to perceive everyone else as fitting into a specific camp you know um, uh, that's that's unfortunate uh, many times because people say well you know are you conservative? Are are you liberal? Are 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 you um, are are you a Catholic? Are you a Protestant? Are you? And they they want to know um, what camp they can put you in, and uh, they they many people feel that everybody has to fit into one camp or another, and there's a sense in which they're violating the possibility of individuality and continuums. Um, as if they're not really genuinely considered. And this is one of the functions of the rigid and fixed beliefs. In fact, in many institutionalized religious environments, part of the goal is to kind of wipe out uh, – they wouldn't put it this way, but I would. Um, they're trying to wipe out the individuality, the, the differences that may exist naturally within people to try to get everybody to sit into the same cookie cutter and come out talking, thinking, walking the same exact way. And they, they have this – notion that somehow when we all come out looking like one model, 
that this somehow is going to persuade the world that this is what's true. Whereas when I see people coming out of an institution all looking identical, I get the impression they've been brainwashed uh, rather than that they've got something really going on. Let's see. Bob is completely ignoring the point here. Yes, repentance means to change your mind, but Jesus and Paul and others in the Bible used it to mean a very different specific kind of mind change, namely about their relationship with God and Christ Almighty. Um, well, you know, I think uh, you, you could say that, and, and I certainly do believe that the purpose here is to change your mind about God, and we haven't specifically nailed that down, but I was talking more about the nature of the word repentance uh, distinguishing it from the idea of uh, that that is often associated with where people think that repentance means feeling sorry and remorse uh, for your sin and and thinking oh this is just terrible uh, the, of me to have been such a lowly lowly person and as if repentance somehow involved some form of embracing of the shame of it all uh, where really what uh, what it is is coming into the light. And of course, uh, although I didn't specifically state what you're saying here, I, I would tend to agree with you that, that, that when, when Paul is talking about it, when Christ is talking about it, the specific repentance they're interested in your making is not, uh, you know, like I'm an audio engineer. I do a lot of reading uh, about it. You know, I have to keep on top of that as a topic because I teach it at, in a college. Uh, but, you know, um, I don't think that the, re the purpose of repentance in my life is so that, well, I, I learn more and more about audio engineering. You're right, yeah. Th that in in re relation to the uh, the topic here as Christ was preaching it and as, as, as Paul was preaching it is who is God, you know? And, and in fact, I'm getting to that and, uh, and you're kind of like jumping the gun, uh, good for you, uh, to notice that it was sort of left out. But I, I'm getting there. And, and, and part of the reason I'm taking time getting there is because I am about ready to make the point that Jesus took his time getting there to that being the point. Um, so let me finish what I was saying, then we'll get over to that and, and it, that it's actually coming up. Um, but good comment there. Now, um, sometimes people want to put you into certain camps camps of thought that, uh, that oh, you're, you're one of these, you're one of those. Uh, but when, when you see the way people use that, uh, they, uh, you know, I've noticed that, uh, when they want to do this, they want you to nominate, put in you in a camp. And, uh, once they've got you there, they figured out what camp you're in. Well, then, then they've got your number. Uh, they've identified you. So now they know whether they have to accept you or reject you based on the what camp you're in. Now they don't even have to think about what you have to say. And this betrays the actual function of fixed and, and rigid beliefs. Uh, the world divides neatly into either us or them. He's a liberal. Don't listen to him. Uh, they're a conservative. They're, they're, just, uh, they're just rigid. They don't care about people. Um, almost everyone who is thoughtfully academic will be uh, told by a fundamentalist uh, that they're a postmodern, you know. Um, we use these labels uh, as a way of putting people into camps, as a way of protecting and justifying our fixed and rigid beliefs. Once a person's camp is identified, you know, that we can just rest in ease in knowing uh, that uh, they are a good person or I can just close my ears knowing that I don't have to listen to a thing they say because they're just one of those people, you know. Uh, anything they say that strikes my ears is uh, just going to be nonsense, so I don't have to listen to it. Now, uh, let me give to you a personal example of this, and, and I will then bring it back to the, the, the concept of, of, of how repentance works in relation to, to who Jesus is. Um, uh, the issue of, of, of gun control, uh, for example, and I'm not going to get too political on you. Uh, you might wonder, what camp am I in? I'll be honest with you. I, I see some problems in, in having guns, but you know what? I, I see some problems in not having guns, and I see some problems in controlling guns, and I see some problems in not controlling guns. And so to be honest with you, I see this as a very difficult and serious problem that is not going to be one that's easily 
dealt with, easily understood, uh, one that's easy to possess a great deal of fears from either side, people who fear what might happen if we don't have them, people who fear what's going to happen when we do. Uh, and many of these fears are genuinely justified. And, and we have plenty of examples to point out uh, just sort of what the difficulties are that people on various sides of this issue can be concerned about. But I got to be honest with you too that I'm not so sure that the the talk that I hear from both sides of that issue are from people who who are really considering the complete complexity of the issue and they sometimes strike me as being people trying to oversimplify it in a direction that only speaks to the particular ways they're concerned and worried and and I'll be honest with you so when it comes to that um uh this is one of those areas where me personally I I can't come to any personal rigid or fixed idea about this at all. I and, and I feel badly about that. I wished I could, but I'm not at a point where I can do that. Um, got another comment. You don't have uh, – you don't have this one, but I'm going to read it. Excuse me. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Bob the one making points. So, okay, okay. All right. Sure. <laughs> excuse me. Thank you. Now, Jesus didn't expect everyone to remain, you know, just kind of open-minded. That's not what I'm getting at here. The the opposite of rigid and fixed does not mean being so open-minded that I never make any conclusions, never come to any ideas. There was a day when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Now, Jesus didn't ask them that you know, like a week after they were into this with him. He went and he called them, as it were, in the way the narrative works. Uh, you know, they, they did a number of things. They went to different places. They preached this. They preached that. He gave – he sent them out. They did various things. Uh, they went through a, a great number of experiences that uh, where they were with Jesus and where he heals, where he preaches, where he teaches, where he is confronted, where he's asked questions by people about politics, ethics, and doctrine and stuff like that. And it's not until Jesus is getting ready to enter Jerusalem uh, in that fateful trip that he actually turns to his disciples. And then he says, you know, he asked them, who do people say that I am? And and then once they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're a prophet, some say you're, you know, and, and, he, and he gets the kind of the, uh, uh, you know, they take a poll, I guess. <laughs> then he asks them, but who do you say that I am? Now, we don't know how many of them actually answered him, but the only one we really seem to know about is when Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and and Jesus' response to this is is even recognizing that Peter didn't just figure this out all by himself. Um, that you know this was something that was really shown to him by by the Father. Uh, and by the way, this doesn't mean that Peter's insight about who Jesus is, was, and what he's all about was even clear because shortly after this, when Jesus is telling them, look, I'm going to have to go into Jerusalem here and there's going to be some things they're going to be doing to me. And Peter takes Jesus aside, no, this is not going to happen to you. And Jesus ends up rebuking Peter, the very one who seemed to be the first to get it as to who he really was. And to me, this is a model of um, – of that, um, this is a model of repentance. Jesus actually lives with them, works with them, interacts with them for a number of years. And they, through this process, in this relationship, seeing the way he, he loves, seeing the way he speaks, seeing the way he does the things he does, they're, they're asking themselves, who is this guy? Who is he? What's going on here? What am I doing here? Am I going to die? You know, a lot of questions are no doubt occurring to them. They're, they don't know whether to be encouraged at times or discouraged. Some of the things they see are just awesome and amazing. And, you know, what's going on here? And Peter finally comes to this point where he realizes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And to Peter, this is radically fundamental to his his sense of uh, of relationship to Jesus it's it's it, it's radical it it is an alteration did peter understand this the first day that uh, jesus came around and said follow me and i will make you fishers of men i i don't think he did but he came to this point 
And that is in many ways the process of, um, of repentance, of the process of that paradigm shift. Peter sees this very differently because of what's been revealed to him, the light he has seen, the person he has seen, the, 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 the events that have been going on before his very eyes, that he can no longer live in denial, that this is his experience, what he has seen, who he has been with. And he comes to this conclusion. It makes sense to him now because of what he has seen. This is that process of, of repentance. And Monica says, uh, I'm not for labels except for soup cans. Uh, not for people. Communication will get us much farther. Um, I agree that the, the labels are, are are oftentimes very abusive. and But I see labels also as being, you know, merely – merely tools that help us get the job done. In a sense, all words are labels. Uh, so, and we've got to use words to communicate. But then again, people are who they are. And the way we understand them or even the words we say to them or the words we use to talk about them or articulate them, are those are just words. And those are the sense in which uh, I, I don't think it's possible to live without labels. It's not even possible to, to entertain the notion of, of labels with people, but it's really just a tool. And, and, and the moment we begin to confuse our understanding of people with who they actually and really are is the moment that label becomes abusive and wrong. Um, uh, but at the same time, sometimes you're talking to someone and you think, um, you know, is this person really very smart? Now, if there's something going on that makes you wonder that, you can't pretend you don't wonder that. Uh, but you don't want to hey, – no, they're just dumb and and therefore everything they ever say after that is just oh, – they're just dumb or that they're useless or whatever. You know, once we, once we turn this label into – and I think this is the idea uh, of the fixed – concept. If we're not willing to let people be someone who surprises us, somebody who has complete freedom to break out of what we may, might be using as labels, um, then uh, then we're misusing the labels. And and for that, you know, labels are only really good on soup cans. Good good point, Monica. I, I think that's that that's that's really and, and you know when. I've often said this about people when they talk to me about my theology. I, I have a theology. I have a concept of God. But you know what? I don't have a relationship with my theology. I don't. I don't have a relationship with God through my theology. My theology is just the kind of way I'm trying to manage it, make sense of it. But when I in – my, in my relationship with God, I, I abide in the presence of the one who is, for me – mysteriously other, and I don't care what the concept is, I'm just with him. And, and I, I, there's just no expectation in a sense of, you know, whether or not he's got to fit into this box or not fit into this box. And, and, and so there's a part of me that seeks in a, in a spirituality to, to kind of transcend the limits of my own mind, the limit of the limits of my own concepts, the limits of my own labels, as it were, and to allow this one who is to just simply be who he is, whatever that is, and and to trust that simply abiding with him, being near him, gives me this in a similar way, the same opportunity Peter had when he finally comes to that realization. You you're the Christ, the Son of the Living God. And uh, and 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 although I'm not walking with Jesus personally, that's that that is in a sense part of what's really going on. Um, there's almost a sense in which when we become a believer, we're actually going through a, a gestation period. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of pregnant with faith. Uh, and there comes a time when it finally comes to that birth of recognizing he is uh, the, the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, um, as we continue on here, uh, he, he asked his disciples, who is it that you, that you say I am? And uh, Peter is the one who who answers him this this declaration that, uh, as far as I know, this is in some sense that that uh, that way in which we understand, you know, okay, who who gets this, who doesn't, and as a as a person who believes in the love of God, I don't want to break this up into an us and them. There's those of us who know He's the Christ the Son of the Living God, and those of them who don't. Um, 
I really see our loving Father and and the and the gift and the work of Christ as one that's in, this is something that is trying to uh, work towards the eventual restoration of, of of all, and the goal here is that there's not going to be an us and them. There's just an there's just an us, and so there may be people who are us now, and those are going to be us later. You know, uh, and and. And, and that's fine. We'll give them all, all the time they need so that their process of repentance is an honest one, an authentic one, and a one that gives them all the love and dignity they have for all the problems that keep them from being able to make sense of this. And uh, we'll, we'll do that. And so we don't need to actually um, change that on them. Uh, viewer comment, uh, the birth of my faith is really painful. It stretches me out more than I'm usually comfortable with. But hey, at least... My next birth is easier. I can I I can identify with that. I um I can identify with it a lot because um I, when I came to faith at first um I was just a little boy and and I was like six or seven years old and first fell in love with the the sense of God as 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 presence, someone who was there. And it was in a church where there wasn't really much theology there and I didn't really have much of a concept of God, didn't even really need one. But my childhood was not a very a, a very happy one, a very pleasant one. And it was one where I actually, you know, in the process of that learn to to hate myself and before i got to the point of having a clearer vision of just who god is um i had to you know the the part of the pain of that process was being honest with how i felt about myself and 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 finding the courage to look myself in the eye recognize all the things that i thought of as as ugly and horrible and um come to recognize that I was not um, uh, being honest or fair with even myself and uh, that's a that's a that was a painful process for me and and I know many people who although they didn't have that kind of an experience they had other experiences and so many times um, sometimes there's even the pain of realizing you know how um, how much uh, suffering I may have gone through that wasn't necessary or how much suffering I may have caused other people that really wasn't necessary because I just didn't understand the love of God at that time. Oh, that it, uh, you know, youth is wasted on the young, you know. <laughs> um, we can sometimes feel that way. Um, Jesus, by the way, was very satisfied with Peter's answer, and I think he was also very satisfied with the fact that um, if he didn't get the same answer from everyone else that was there, his other disciples, he didn't seem to be, uh, what's the wrong with you other people? How come you're not getting what Peter's got? Have I been this long with you? You know. Now, there were some times when he did get uh, a bit frustrated and expressed it, but, um, you know, that... Uh, and and I can understand where that would come from, but that was not his his nature's demeanor all the time, and it wasn't the sort of thing that they had to live under the threat of. Uh, there was this real process that the, that was a part of it, sometimes frustrating. Um, how do you deal though with those people whose beliefs are rigid? What do you do? Can you tell them that they're rigid? Um, you you might. You can try that. You you might not find it succeeding, um, and some of them might say, "You you better believe it. I know what I believe, and I'm not changing, and I'm 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 solid, and I'm consistent." And 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 they might take a great deal of a pride in the faithfulness and loyalty that they show in being rigid. Uh, so you you can tell them, but I don't think you can expect that it's going to end up being successful. Uh, and there's several uh, different uh, responses you're likely to incur. First of all. Um, there can be projections, you know. If you if you say it in a way where you're indicating that this rigidness is an inappropriate one, uh, they might actually see you as as opposing them with a certain rigidity of your own, and say, "No, no, I'm not the one here being rigid. I'm just being honest with the truth, and you're the one who's rigidly finding problems with what it is I'm telling you is so." You know, so they might project that rigidness on you, even if you're not even convinced that they're wrong. You're just finding problems with what they're saying. Um, they might react with uh, with fear. Uh, they they might consider you an enemy who uh, who finds the problem with their rigidness of belief, and they might respond with some authoritative aggression. Uh, they might respond with some dogmatism and demonstrate a real intolerance with any ambiguity. Um, 
See, we have another thing. Uh, Bob, you haven't, you, have you ever encountered an opportunity for repentance that was so painful that you just couldn't go through it? Um, I, I, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I've gone through some things that were a part of my, my process of shift that uh, if I had faced that earlier, it, it, it would have been very powerful. I, so I, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, and I suppose there's some ways in which you can't see what you can't see. Uh, and as soon as you can see it, it's, it's there. Uh, I, I've had a few times though, when, you know, when it's, uh, I went through a, a particular experience. I don't want to talk too much about it, um, where I, I just came to a real pinnacle of self-loathing and, um, uh, is I saw some things and aspects of myself, but um, it that that uh, that experience ended in my uh, having this incredible sense of being loved by God, quite in spite of what I was seeing, and it was kind of confusing at first. How can I see myself in in such a apparently appropriate loathsome manner and yet be loved? And it, and it took me a while to 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 work that through and begin to love myself and to give myself space for the 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 difficulties and the issues that I was that I was dealing with. Um, so I I really don't know how to answer that. Uh, you know, pain is pain. Um, and uh, we seem to, uh, we seem. If, if there's anything that was so painful, I couldn't go through it. Evidently, I haven't gone through it yet. <laughs> um, my life isn't filled with as much pain these days. In 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 that regard, I, I I'm more smooth sailing. A, a, a sense of confidence that has grown. That I am loved. That I'm lovely to God, and uh, that uh, that uh, the some of the difficulties that may show up now are are quite awesomely wonderful part of the uh, the process and and we'll we'll do this you know without any problem uh without any um rejection of it i should say um now in some of these things that we're we want to finish up what what are some of the reactions you might get uh we talked about how they might respond with say some dogmatism and ambiguity uh they're, they're intolerance with ambiguity i mean uh they will deny that they're unreasonable they will cling to the accuracy of their alleged uh, of the alleged misperceptions uh they will they'll oftentimes uh, hold on to it they'll dismiss any suggestions that their ideas are absurd and um sometimes they will be provoked with annoyance and uh, can sometimes you know kind of ruin their mood um but uh not all is necessarily lost particularly if we can find um I suggest that what's really better is be honest about what you see. Be honest about if you see them as rigid, if it's appropriate to mention it. But it probably makes more sense to simply love them as people, to simply respect their dignity, to if there is something that you can see that's even admirable in the mistakes that you think that they're making, to even point those out and, and appreciate them. And and uh, many times I find some people who, for example – um, are very um, very rigid in their beliefs that I can uh, I can appreciate for why that might make a lot of sense to them and actually be very um, very pleased with the fact that they're not going to move from their position until they have a good reason to do so and uh, give them permission to not have to move yet. Um, now, you might find that some of them, when you approach them with this, will uh, recouch their message in a way that makes it sound as if it's more flexible, even though it isn't. Uh, they will probably remain blind to the ways that they hold on to these rigid beliefs in a way that they don't realize yet. Now, rigid beliefs are, are – are, keep you stuck, but sometimes they cause us to lead a lifestyle when we, when we defend them. Well, we don't realize that we're actually abusing other people and violating their boundaries in order to hold on uh, to our status quo. Uh, to those people whose ideas are overly fixed and rigid, perception for them is reality. What they perceive is reality and they've lost this, this clear distinction between what really is and, 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 and what it seems to be to me. Now, it's one thing to be very – you have to be honest with what it seems to you to be. But uh, we've got to be a little more honest than that. We have to realize that the, the way things seem to be to us 
um, is not necessarily the way they really are. And that that little bit of humility is what uh, helps us to make that difference. So although I'm recommending we don't follow into these rigid beliefs and ideas, uh, I'm also not saying we have to remain indecisive or uncommitted of anything Im- important or that we have to be intolerable of the idea of coming to a conclusion. The process of discovery is not hasty, but it is successful. Anyhow, that's my uh, my little chat tonight about uh, rigid beliefs and ideas, and I would encourage you to, to live loved. Uh, know know the Father's love with you, the, the love of Christ, and that this would be the kind of thing that actually brings you to a lifestyle of a paradigm shift that brings you into the marvelous sense of, of, of living loved. And I'll see you on Wednesday. You take care.